Hello and welcome to another edition of Miles to Go. I'm Miles O'Brien. Sorry for the hiatus. The dog ate my homework. That's all I got. On this edition, we are talking nukes. Not power plants, but rather bombs. Or to borrow and adapt from a famous movie subtitle, How I Learned to Start Worrying and Fear the Bomb. I'm joined this time by an eminence grease in the world of atomic weapons, nuclear scientist and metallurgist Siegfried Hecker. I'm at the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. But I first met Sig in the mid-90s when he was director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, the place where the bomb was born during World War II. I went to see him the other day at his home in Santa Fe, worried about the possibility of World War III. Sig Hecker has spent a lot of time in North Korea. He has been shocked, surprised, and frankly impressed by what he saw and heard about their weapons program. And today he is troubled by how the U.S. is handling this erratic, capricious, determined regime. First of all, just give me a quick history of your experience and interest and um, understanding of North Korea and its nuclear program. Well, first of all, uh, I was taken to North Korea by a colleague from Stanford University. I was still at Los Alamos. Uh, in late 2003, I got a phone call from my colleague, John Lewis, who had been going to North Korea in what we call track two diplomacy, sort of non-official, non-governmental uh, diplomacy. And he had a chance to go back. Uh, and so he asked me to come along because the North Koreans indicated they'd actually take him to the nuclear facilities. And he was a political scientist. And he said, why don't you come along? Uh, and so that's how I first uh, uh, got to North Korea in January of 2004. So you, and at that time, you were the director of the Los Alamos National uh, Laboratory? So no, I, I was still uh, working at Los Alamos yeah. National Laboratory. I was a senior fellow, but removed from the directorship by seven years. Okay. Uh, I had uh, uh, left the directorship in 1997 in November and went back to the faculty, so to speak. So, uh, but I was still employed at, at Los Alamos in 2004. That was my first trip to North Korea. And quite frankly, I didn't want to go to North Korea. <laughs> you know, I'd gone to Russia many times. I'd gone to China. I've been to many places. I didn't want to go to North Korea, but John was a very insistent guy. So, and you didn't want to go, you weren't curious a little bit? Oh, so I was very curious, but I didn't know much about North Korea. Uh, and certainly just on the basis of what you hear, you know, generally, uh, it wasn't a particularly um, a friendly place. And so John, I said, no, I don't really want to go to North Korea. He was insistent. I'd also thought that um, uh, by the time the North Koreans found out who he wanted to bring, and that is former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, that they would say no. And if they didn't say no, surely our government would say no, if I'm going to tell them I'm going to go to North Korea. It turns out I was wrong on both accounts in January of 2004, I wound up in North Korea. And then, just to give you the history, then I went seven years in a row, uh, each year from 2004 to 2010, seven visits. Uh, and then I haven't been back there since. So going back to that first visit, though, you, you must have been pretty surprised you got on that plane at all, given who you are and, and, and um, where you were going. So I, I was amazed uh, uh, to get even as far as Beijing, uh, you know, and the, sitting there at the airport, uh, waiting to get in from Beijing to Pyongyang and touchdown in Pyongyang. Uh, that was strange enough. Uh, and then uh, even just to see Pyongyang, to see what North Korea looks like, looked very different than what I expected. Uh, and then they had decided for a variety of reasons, uh, they were going to show us a significant part uh, of their uh, nuclear complex, particularly the plutonium complex. And, and that, yeah, that was just, uh, it, it was an eye-opener. It was really surprising. So had you, prior to that, uh, do you think underestimated what they had accomplished at that point? I mean, were you surprised at what you saw? Mm -hmm. in other words? Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was very much surprised by their uh, capabilities and their competence. Uh, the facilities, uh, you know, what they took us through is, uh, first was the nuclear reactor. Uh, this is a nuclear reactor that they actually built themselves, patent after one uh, in Great Britain. Uh, and um, 
that wasn't very modern, so that wasn't surprising. You, you know, you looked at the electronics, it was old strip chart recorders. It was the way Los Alamos, I'm sure, looked in the 50s, or Russia looked in the 1960s. Uh, however, it was functional. They had turned the reactor back on, which had sat in mothballs uh, since the 1994 agreed framework, an agreement that President Clinton made with the North Koreans. And, and they were able to restart it, uh, and it functioned. Uh, then they took us uh, to what we call the spent fuel pool. So in other words, in a reactor, you, you can make plutonium. You make plutonium. Uh, and then you have to extract the plutonium from whatever fuel uh, remains. And that you do in, in a chemical processing facility. But first, you have to go ahead and allow that fuel to cool temperature-wise and also radioactively. But this fuel had been sitting in there because of the agreement uh, for the better part of uh, eight years. Uh, and the question was, was it still in there or did they reprocess it? Because our intel agencies didn't know. Uh, there was actually a dispute as to whether they might have taken them out or not taken them out. So they wanted to show me that they took them out. Then they took us to the reprocessing facility. They toured us through the reprocessing facility. It was not operating at the time I was there because they had already finished their campaign of reprocessing. But same thing, uh, you know, pretty primitive, primitive electronics, primitive general setup of the laboratory, but functional. Uh, and then most importantly, you know, when you, when you visit a place like that, it's not just important to see the facilities. What's actually more important is you have to talk to the people. You have to understand how much do they know. You know so I asked them about what we call the Purex process. Uh, that's the chemical process that you use to extract the plutonium from this spent fuel mixture. They knew everything about the Purex process. Uh, the most fascinating part was actually uh, at the end of that particular visit in the reprocessing facility, uh, they declared to me, they said, well, Dr. Ecker, we've now shown you our deterrent. Uh, and I said, well, uh, you know, you really haven't shown me your deterrent. A deterrent takes three things. You have to have the bomb fuel. That means you either have to have plutonium, highly enriched uranium. Then you've got to be able to weaponize. You've got to build, you got to design the bomb, you've got to build the bomb, and you probably have to test the bomb. And then third, you have to deliver the bomb. So those are the three components. All I saw is I saw a facility that, where you can make it. I saw where you stored the fu spent fuel. I saw where you can reprocess. You know how to do it, but uh, I didn't see it. And the other two parts I didn't see at all. So at that point, the director of the facility, uh, Director Lee Young Sup, said, well, how'd you like to see our product? And I was there with my colleagues, uh, Professor Lewis and others, and I said, um, you mean the plutonium? We were sitting in a conference room. Uh, and he said, why, sure. <laughs> and I said, well, I've seen a lot of plutonium in my lifetime. You know, I first actually handled plutonium in 1965 when I came to Los Alamos a as a young graduate student. And so I'd seen a lot of plutonium. I'd worked with plutonium. I said, sure, bring it out. And lo and behold, they brought this plutonium. Usually you don't take plutonium into a conference room, but they <laughs> did. And so they brought out this red metal box, you know, about yay big. I opened it up and took out a white wooden box. It had a slide off top and they slit the top off uh, and I sort of looked in and there were two glass jars in there. And the first thing you look at if somebody says they have plutonium, you know, are they closed? Because you do want to make sure that the jar is closed because with plutonium uh, you don't want to ingest it or to inhale it. Uh, if it's in the glass jar, you're okay. So I look in and they say, well, this is our product. And there was a piece of uh, plutonium metal in there, actually a thin wall funnel. And then the other one had a, a powder, a plutonium oxalate, as it's called. And they said, well, there's 200 grams of our product, 150 grams of plutonium oxalate. Uh, so I looked at it. So they, they showed me that because they wanted so badly to convince me they have a deterrent, which of course would mean they have to have the bomb. And so they must have thought through how much do they have to show me uh, in order that I conclude uh, that they actually have the bomb. Then when I finally, you know, when they sort of to themselves must have declared victory, they showed me this stuff, I, I was still skeptical. Uh, and then I said to them, I said, well, you know, I don't have any instrumentation with me to be able to tell 
uh, whether that's really plutonium or not. So the, the only sensor I had with me that would help me, first of all, the eyes, and, and it looked good. Uh, but then the second thing are the hands. So I actually asked them, can I hold the plutonium jar? Just a metal jar, I didn't want to hold the powder jar. So can I hold that jar? <coughs> Uh, and the director said, oh, sure, but you must wear gloves. Okay, so he brought out these Playtex kitchen gloves. You know. I hold the plutonium, and, and the sensor part is, is it heavy? Plutonium is very, very dense, you know, almost three times as dense as iron. Uh, and then second, is it warm? Because it is radioactive. It was both. But I still told them, yeah, it looked like plutonium, you know, felt like plutonium, but in the end, I didn't have any instrumentation I didn't know. Because what I was concerned about is that they would use my visit essentially for propaganda. It turns out they never did. Uh, but in that process, the bottom line is I got to go inside. I got to see the facilities. I got to meet and talk to the people. And I was not there as an inspector. You know, so if I'd go there as an inspector, you know, what do you do when you get your house inspected you know, by government authorities? You try to make sure they don't see the things that you may be worried about. It'd be the same in the nuclear facility. They wanted to show me things because they wanted me to come away with certain conclusions. So uh, it, it's just such a surreal scene you just painted for me. Really, I mean, as, as, as it was happening, could you believe it was happening at all? So it, it, it was actually interesting. So once I got in that facility, then everything just else played off uh, in real world. I mean, I was, you know, I've been in so many nuclear facilities uh, I've been all over the Russian nuclear facilities. By that time, I'd been in the Chinese Los Alamos, the Russian Los Alamos, the Russian Lawrence Livermore, and of course, I'd previously been in Great Britain and French uh, facilities. And so once you get in there, then, you, you know, my, my most important thing was I was just trying to learn as much as possible, and then also trying to figure out what are, what are they trying to tell me and why are they trying to tell me that. So what was the conclusion you walked away with at that point? So at the time, actually, it, it was interesting in terms of conclusions because the North Koreans were very interested as to what my conclusion would be. Uh, and so at the uh, dinner that night, um, uh, you know, and Yongbyon is out about 90 kilometers from Pyongyang. And so we drove out there in the morning. Uh, we drove back late afternoon. Uh, and then we had dinner uh, with Vice Minister Kim gi uh, He was the highest ranking official uh, that we met. Uh, and he was very anxious to find out what I concluded from that visit. Uh, and I was, at that point, the most important thing to me was that I was a technical guy. I was a technical specialist. And I need to give the technical answer. No politics, nothing, just technical answer. And so I described to him, and I actually said, look, here are the seven things that I uh, would conclude from this visit, and when I get back to the United States, uh, I'm gonna report that uh, uh, to my government. Uh, and, but I'm gonna tell you first uh, as to what I conclude. So I walked all the way through, and essentially, essentially what I told them, they had facilities that were operating. They had people who really knew what they were doing. They were really competent. Uh, that they were extremely cooperative in working with me, uh, and that I saw the place where I know they can make plutonium, uh, that I know I saw the place where they can reprocess the plutonium. I actually saw something that looked like plutonium, but I could not conclude it for sure. Uh, so I went through all of that, uh, and uh, Vice Minister actually said, well, you know, Dr. Hack, I'm, I'm disappointed. I had thought you would conclude more than that. Uh, in other words, he had hoped that I'd actually say, well, you must have the bomb. But I didn't say that uh, at the time. Uh, so, uh, but in the end, after he told me he was disappointed, uh, then he said, but Dr. Huck, I understand. You're a scientist, and you have to say it the way it is. So he said, you go back, you tell your government everything you just told me. Don't add anything, don't subtract anything. So I did, and I gave testimony. Uh, to the Senate, uh, it was actually Senate Foreign Relations Committee uh, in January 21st of 2004. However, then subsequently, uh, we went, since I was still at Los Alamos, you know, we have all these facilities and capabilities here. In essence, what we did was go back and try to simulate everything that happened there. And once we did that, then I came back and said, 
Look, what I saw was plutonium. If they can make plutonium that shape, thin wall funnel, they can make the bomb. And so the conclusion then at that point was, on the basis of what they showed me, they have the plutonium, they can make the bomb. So um, the plutonium itself, I, I, I want to talk, I like the way you divided your paper, talking about you know, what we know about the materials they have to make a bomb. Plutonium is actually easier to get a handle on because of the nature of how you make plutonium. You have to fire up a reactor. Is that accurate to say? Yeah, so the, the three pieces, you know, the bomb fuel, the weaponization, uh, and the delivery. So if you look at the bomb fuel, uh, you make plutonium in a reactor. Now, it's not easy to build a reactor, uh, but a technically competent country can build a reactor, particularly they had help early on in a research reactor that was even smaller yet from the Soviets. And by the way, the Soviets did it to help them with peaceful uses of atomic energy. They built a reactor for the North Koreans about the same time we built a reactor for Iran. So this was not unusual. And they trained their people. Okay? Uh, and then uh, the reactor, for example, in Great Britain, that was of a similar nature, uh, and it was not a classified reactor. The North Koreans got those drawings, and they built a reactor. And so, in essence, they had the capabilities, because of their training, because of their own industrial capability, to build a reactor. Then to extract it, uh, the chemical processing, so forth. Again, uh, you know, a, a reasonably uh, good uh, technological uh, base uh, will allow you to do that. And in the case uh, of the reprocessing facility, the chemistry, uh, they, re they reverse engineered one from Belgium. So they were able to do that. Uh, so yes, in this case, they were able to make the plutonium. And at that time, they were doing this. They had the capabilities, the background, the training, uh, to be able to build their own reactor and extract the plutonium. So they and this is the Soviet version of Atoms for Peace that, that, that made this happen, right? Is exactly, that, yeah. exactly. This would have, so this would have been 50s, 60s? So, so the Soviets built the first reactor for them around 1967. Okay. And then by 1986, they had built this larger reactor with which they were able to make plutonium, and they built that themselves. By 86, then, by the time they had the reactor to make plutonium, by 91, 92, which is when they had the reprocessing facility complete, they did not have the capability to make centrifuges. So yes, for them, centrifuges were technologically more difficult because they didn't have the capabilities, they didn't have the materials, they didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the training for centrifuges, because that's a place where the Russians and Soviets never helped them. So yes, it was more difficult uh, to do uranium. And then actually, the third piece that's important for the bomb fuel, uh, if you want to make a hydrogen bomb, uh, then you need plutonium uranium for the fission bomb, the atomic bomb as we call it, uh, in order to actually use sort of the energy from that, the sort of x-rays that are generated, that you channel down to the hydrogen fuel that you compress in order to get fusion in a hydrogen bomb. And the hydrogen fuel are heavy forms of hydrogen, namely deuterium and, and tritium. And so you have to have that. So, now, so first of all, 1986, 1991, 92, uh, when I first went there in 2004, they had plutonium. They had no enriched uranium. Uh, they may have had trickles of tritium, but nothing of any consequence. So, um, so at that stage, there were too many pieces missing to make a conclusive statement about what kind of bombs they might have. Is, is that accurate to say? Yeah, so in, in, in 2004, uh, so my conclusion was they, they sort of built a few bombs by 2004 time frame. Uh, and, and they, um, I would say those are primitive, uh, and because they were plutonium type, uh, they would be like a Nagasaki bomb, uh, what we call Fat Man. Mm -hmm. And the Nagasaki bomb uh, only took a little over six grams, uh, six kilograms, uh, sorry, let me back up, Nagasaki bomb, a little over six kilograms of plutonium. Uh, and be because plutonium is dense, it's that much, you know, the size of a grapefruit. 
uh, and what one was able to estimate and calculate uh, as to how much plutonium they may have in that spent fuel that had been stored there for eight years during the agreed framework is perhaps 25 kilograms. So they may have had enough for four uh, bombs or so, uh, but they hadn't tested. So in most likelihood, it was primitive. And what, what I mean by primitive is Nagasaki uh, was primitive. So it had plutonium surrounded with high explosive and then making sure that you set off the high explosive appropriately to squeeze the plutonium and make the nuclear reaction go. So even though the plutonium uh, was only six kilograms or so, the bomb was this big, 10,000 pounds, uh, huge. That's primitive. So that's what I assessed then they had. And, and even by the time, then they finally tested in 2006. I was there two weeks after they tested, talked to the director uh, of the Yongbyon facility again. Uh, they told me it, it worked uh, just fine, and I said, well, it didn't seem to work so well, you know, because the seismic signal was quite small. Uh, but nevertheless, they had, a, they had a first test, at least a proof of principle that they were able to make the fission reaction go. Uh, and by the time uh, President Bush left office in 2008, they still only had sort of a handful of primitive bombs. Okay, so now um, let's talk about how they enriched you. One final thought on that, though. Can, can, is there a way to ballpark, based on what you saw there versus what we know today, versus the activity of that reactor, how much plutonium they might have been able to make over the years? Is that possible, even? Yeah, so as we look then um, at the bomb fuel and how do we estimate uh, what they have, it, it turns out uh, we have a good handle on the plutonium uh, because the plutonium has to be made in the reactor. Plutonium has to be extracted. A and those are big facilities and we know when those facilities are operating. Back in the, you know, in the old days, only the spy agencies would know that. Uh, but in today's world, you have commercial satellites. North Korea is the most watched place in the world. You know when the reactor is operating. They had people not only like me, but they had international inspectors all over that facility from 1994 to 2002. We knew everything about that reactor. So when you know the reactor, you know its design, you know its output power, you know when it's operating, you can calculate how much plutonium they could make. Then you make some assumptions as to how much they might lose sort of in the reprocessing campaign, and you come up with an assumption. And so today, for example, uh, I have quite good confidence that North Korea has at most sort of 20 to 40 kilograms of plutonium. That's all they have, 20 to 40 kilograms. It's not much, but the problem is it doesn't take much. You know, Nagasaki was six kilograms, maybe four or five or six, depending you know, on how good they are. So first of all, then, we have um, high confidence. And second, we have high observability. So in other words, when they crank that reactor back up, we know it. We know when it's running, we know when it's not running, and we calculate. Given the fact that you were brought there and shown the facility, shown the plutonium, they want the world to know this, correct? Yeah, right, right. So, so actually, I mean, that's one of the very interesting aspects you know, in terms of what we can see without them hiding it, uh, what they show us without us even asking, or what they show us, for example, when people like me asked who had a chance to get in, so there are certain things that they want us to see definitely. And so our job then becomes as we try, and, and my job, the way that I view it, I sort of am an analyst. I, I try to understand, I mean, what I really want to do, I want to understand North Korea. To understand North Korea, I have to understand what can they do in the nuclear world. So I try to assess that. And so they show us all of these things, and then I try to assess how much of that uh, is real, or, or are we becoming overconfident in what we can do? Uh, and so with plutonium, we're quite good. With highly enriched uranium, the most important thing to stress there uh, is we have low confidence and we have almost no observability. So all estimates of highly enriched uranium are very uncertain. So when you look at the issue of highly enriched uranium, uh, does it go to AQ Khan? Is that what made 
the, if possible for them to build uh, an array of centrifuges. The Soviets weren't helping them. I presume the Chinese weren't. It must have been Khan. Is that accurate to say? Well, so, so yes, uh, AQ Khan uh, appeared to play uh, a very big role in their centrifuge program, but not the only role by far. A quick reminder, Abdul Qadir, AQ Khan, is the former nuclear physicist considered the father of Pakistan's atomic bomb. He is a bad actor, to say the least, selling nuclear technology, bombs, missiles, and know-how to Iran, North Korea, Libya, and possibly other countries over the years. They were just so clever themselves uh, of using what, what I would call sort of a, a leaky international export control market. Uh, because what, what apparently what AQ Khan did already in the early 1990s, uh, they made contacts between Pakistan and North Korea about centrifuge technology. And by the late 1990s, uh, AQ Khan was marketing centrifuge technology around the world. Uh, North Korea was just one of those, Iraq, uh, Libya, uh, Iran uh, as well. Uh, and AQ Khan had set up quite a network uh, for imports uh, for the Pakistanis. Uh, and then, in essence, what the North Koreans did was also develop and maybe use much of that same network to bring the key materials that they were not able to produce themselves. So for example, for centrifuges, uh, you need either very high strength aluminum alloys or high strength steel, high strength steel being significantly better. Uh, that high strength steel, we believe the North Koreans were not able to manufacture themselves in the 1990. Uh, and so what you find is they went out shopping and they found eager sellers, <laughs> you know, people who were willing to sell those clandestinely uh, on, on the market. And the North Koreans were very clever in picking that up. So they used AQ Khan's help. Uh, AQ Khan apparently gave them a couple of dozen centrifuges. Uh, and then the rest, they got these materials from the different places. And then from what we know, it also looks like they sent technicians from North Korea to work at the Khan Research Laboratory in Pakistan to actually learn how to make these centrifuges work in a cascade, you, you know, when they're all linked up, which is a very, very complicated process so that they don't crash because these centrifuges have to rotate at enormous speeds in order to separate the two forms of uranium that you typically have uh, in, in uranium ore. And that is uranium-238, the heavier stuff which you can't make bombs out of, Uranium-235, the lighter, so you have to spin it very fast in gaseous form. All of those things are very difficult. So yes, they had help, uh, and it took a long, long, determined, steady effort to do so. Uh, but then in the end, uh, they did not import those centrifuges from someplace else. They built them in North Korea. So they had certainly assistance from the outside, but it is, it is a testament to their own ingenuity. Were you uh, impressed by their ability to do what they've done, taking aside the, the consequences and the intent? Uh, they seem pretty um, smart about this. So I'm, I'm very much impressed by their technical competence, even though I don't like what they wound up with. But nevertheless, you have to be impressed with their technical competence. So they, they are particularly good in engineering, uh, they're also very, very determined, uh, and they were able to put these things together. And, and that's, in essence, what they wound up showing me in 2010. So one of the reasons to explain the uncertainties uh, of highly enriched uranium uh, is that these are the centrifuges they've never shown uh, in their photos. Uh, for example, there is no photograph of Kim Jong-un actually visiting the centrifuge facility. Uh, they are photographs of him visiting the machinery that's used to make the centrifuge rotors. There, there are also photographs of his father, Kim Jong-il, and also Kim Jong-un, uh, visiting places where they look like they have the preforms of, of the high-strength steels, but none of them in the centrifuge facilities. So the only information we have as to what these centrifuge facilities may look like is when my Stanford colleagues and I, the John Lewis, Bob Carlin, and myself, uh, were invited in to see this centrifuge facility in a building I'd been in before, and it was dedicated to something totally different. 
And, and quite frankly, that one was probably the biggest shock of all of my visits to North Korea. So they, they brought you in, this is the, the famous blue roof building. Right, that, that people had seen, but it would have no idea. It's not like a, a reactor that's creating um, plutonium ultimately. You don't, you don't see anything, there's no signature, correct? Right, so, so in November uh, of 2010, uh, when they took us out to Yongbyon, and, and by the way, they told us the, the night before, they said, tomorrow uh, we will have a big surprise for you. <laughs> and they did. Uh, actually, there was, they were also building a new reactor. Uh, so they were building a new reactor. That wasn't too surprising. And I'd asked before on the way to getting back in, I said, you know, they had claimed that they had done some centrifuge work and were successful. And I said, well, I want to see the centrifuge facility. So they took me in. And of course, I knew nothing about the Blue Roof because you're on the ground. You know, I went in this building. I'd been building four before. Uh, however, it was, the outside was totally, uh, you know, renovated. They had marble steps going up, you know, a uh, picture of the leader, the deer leader at that time, and a big inscription there. And they took us up to the second floor uh, and uh, had, made, had us look down through these big glass observation windows at, at these two centrifuge halls down uh, below. And it was just, uh, my, my jaw must have dropped this far because I just couldn't believe it. Then we went into the control room, and unlike the strip chart recorders in the 50s and 60s light of equipment, these were flat panel monitors, LED light emitting diode, uh, you know, monitor devices. And it was it was just computers. It was incredible. So they built this modern facility, and then later I found out that's the building with the blue roof. And so it was almost like they painted the bullseye <laughs> on top. But it does turn out, in all fairness, uh, they use blue roofs a lot for, for a modern, uh, for a new reconstruction or whatever. But the bottom line is nobody knew. Does that mean our intel was bad? No. It simply means you don't know when somebody's making centrifuges. Unlike a reactor, you can hide those things. You don't know where they are. You don't know when they operate. Uh, and so. That's the only look anybody has gotten inside the centrifuge facilities. And again, it wasn't just looking at the facility because you can't really tell if it's operating or not. It was talking to their engineers that was most important to try to get an assessment as what kind of centrifuges are these. In talking to the engineers, were you impressed with their knowledge of what was in that building? So in, in the plutonium buildings, I, I was, very impressed with their knowledge and their competence. The uranium centrifuge building was different, uh, and that is, when I went into the plutonium facilities, they were eager to show me this. They were eager to actually uh, display the knowledge of plutonium metallurgy, for example. When I was in the steps going in, ready to get into the centrifuge facility, the um, Chief process engineer, he was called. I had not met him before. He came from someplace else. Uh, he took us in. He says, Dr. Hecker, we did not want to show you this facility, but our superiors made us do it. And then the next half hour, <laughs> you know, it was, I had to extract all the information from him. Uh, he was not volunteering any information. He did not want us in that facility. But I think I was able to extract enough information from him and from some of the other people that I had known and that I built you know, good relationships with. So we made an assessment. And so I make an assessment today for how much uranium do they have, uh, highly enriched uranium. Uh, I was also convinced in terms of what I saw. And, and this, again, this is why you have to be there uh, on, on the ground. You have to see the people. You've got to talk to them. You've got to pull the string when they, you got to pull the string when they answer the questions. Uh, and on that basis, from what I saw, there was no question when I saw that facility, they had another facility someplace else where they had already demonstrated the basic working of these centrifuge cascades as to how you put 164 of them or whatever number of them together to make them work, make them rotate. A and one depends on the other. You know, that's why they're called cascades. That's not uh, easy to do. They had to have done that done someplace else because there's no way they could move that, totally start from scratch, build it in that building, 
in like 18 months from the time they had thrown out the international inspectors until I got back in there. So then we knew they had something else. Uh, so we put all of that together. And so today, as I look at the bomb fuel part of this, so plutonium 20 to 40 kilograms. Uh, highly enriched uranium, again, great uncertainty, maybe 250 to 500 kilograms, something on that order. Uh, you put that all together, uh, that's enough of the fissile materials, the bomb fuel, for perhaps 25 to 30 bombs. So uh, we don't know where this second facility is. It, 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 could it be right there in, in Yangon, or could it be somewhere else? It, we don't know, right? There's no way to know. So, so first of all, I, I personally do not know. Uh, I suspect that um, our intel agencies, as well as those of the other countries, also do not know because it's so easy to hide. Um, I uh, would doubt that it's in Yangbyon. It just would not make sense to have it in Yangbyon. Uh, it would make the most sense to have it outside of Yangbyon, some distance. Uh, and actually, you know, I put my estimates uh, on the basis that. Uh, they do much of the early enrichment to its what we call low enriched uranium in that facility, which, by the way, from the time I saw it, they doubled it a few years later. Or at least they doubled the roof. Again, we don't know what's inside. But we generally, I believe they doubled that facility. So they, they would enrich it to the low levels that you'd use in, in that little reactor that they're building. That's three and a half to four percent of this 235 uranium. And then they take it off someplace else, and they finish it off. Bomb grade, you'd like to have about 90% of this 235 uranium. Most likely to do that someplace else, at least one other facilities, perhaps two. Uh, and, and again, we have to put all of those into these estimates. And then we have to go and say, well, you know, were the rotors uh, of those centrifuges really high strength steel, which is what I surmise from pulling the string with the chief process engineer. If they were aluminum, you're automatically off by a factor of four. And so that, that's the uncertainty. And also, I mean, that may be part of the reasons why the North Koreans aren't showing us much or telling us much. And why they showed me that facility. They wanted the Americans, I believe, to realize that now we'll never know how much they have and where they have. So the uncertainty was the message, wasn't it, in a sense? First of all, the, the first thing, the certainty was we have highly enriched uranium. And then along with that, but you'll never know how much. Correct me if I'm wrong as a, as a history major. You can make a bomb just with plutonium, or you can make a bomb just with highly enriched uranium. Um, do we, when you say, help us understand what, what you need to make a bomb, and we can move into the whole weaponization component of it. A typical bomb, uh, you know, there's one stage, there's two stage. Maybe give us a little primer on that. That would be helpful. Yeah, so, so just sort of the, uh, you know, bombs 101. Yeah. Uh, there, there are generally two types of fission bombs, uh, and uh, you can describe them as Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So Hiroshima was a, a simple, what we call gun assembly. You basically take two subcritical masses, uh, in this case of highly enriched uranium, uh, and you put them in a gun barrel, you have a propellant, and you slap them together very fast. It blows up, that's Hiroshima, approximately 13 kilotons. Uh, uh, again, one city destroyed one plane. In the Manhattan Project, uh, the scientists here knew that you could also use plutonium, that you could make plutonium, and so we're building reactors up at Hanford, also some at Oak Ridge. Uh, and made plutonium. And for plutonium, they found out, rather embarrassingly, <laughs> uh, in late 44, uh, that plutonium doesn't work for this gun assembly. There's some good physics reasons that gun assembly is not fast enough for plutonium. That you can, you can take uh, these fission bombs and you can boost them. And this is what they call a boosted primary, the, the front end of a hydrogen. So a boosted bomb is one where you take highly enriched uranium or plutonium and you actually put the fusion fuel inside to sort of help light more uh, of, uh, of the plutonium or highly enriched uranium. And the most important part of boosting is actually to be able to make that fission bomb smaller uh, and lighter. So the North Koreans 
uh, it looks like they never bothered with the primitive gun assembly with the Hiroshima device. They went right to uh, an implosion uh, weapon and used plutonium. And then since that time, you know, since uh, 2006, their first test, which didn't work so well, the second one in 2009 worked just fine. And now altogether they've done six. And so uh, as we try to assess, uh, you know, what kind of bombs can they build, the weaponization part, uh, we know nothing about weaponization except they've now shown us tidbits of what their devices might look like. And so it looks like they may have walked through a sort of a first plutonium implosion device, uh, eventually may have gotten to a boosted uh, device, uh, and then uh, it looks uh, as if this last test, the yield, the explosive yield of that is large enough uh, that, that uh, in most likelihood, my view is it was most likely a hydrogen bomb, which we call a two-stage bomb. Two-stage meaning you have the plutonium or uranium part that provides the fission, uh, provides the appropriate energy in x-rays, and then squeezes the hydrogen, deuterium, tritium uh, bomb fuel, the isotopes of hydrogen, uh, for, for a fusion device. So it looks like they may actually have walked through all of those capabilities. You know, so start in 2004 for the first bombs that they built 2003 into 2004, first test 2006, 2016, 10 years later. That's actually a long time. And so it's not that surprising that over that many years, the test spaced out in time they learn enough from one test to the next to be able to develop that. It seems to me um, along the way we have um, latched on to their failures and, and uh, taken that as, as, as some solace. Um, are we missing the point here uh, on what they were learning from those failures? And, and have they in fact, uh, for, for you, in your view, made good steady progress toward their goal? So absolutely. In, in terms of testing, uh, I would say only the first one was a failure. failure. Failure meaning it wasn't what they had designed it to be. Because uh, strangely enough, they actually told the Chinese that that first test would be four kilotons, which is pretty low. Again, uh, you know, Hiroshima was 13, uh, Trinity, Nagasaki were up, uh, that's the plutonium, closer to 20. Uh, so they said they were going to do four kilotons. It was a little strange that uh, they designed it for that small, but they did. Uh, part of it could be they might, might have been concerned as to how they're going to contain this uh, test. Of course, all the tests were done uh, underground, you know, in, in a mountain uh, uh, to, to contain it. Uh, so that first one uh, was a failure in a sense. It wasn't as designed. And that's probably the one they learned the most from, because you learn in science, you learn more from failure than you do from success. And so they learned a lot. And then by 2009, uh, that one was maybe in the neighborhood of four kilotons, and you know, maybe uh, somewhere, uh, actually, it probably average around seven is, is the guess. Uh, and uh, at that point, I said, hey, that's good enough. You know, if they make seven kilotons, they can make 20 kilotons. Then they just steadily moved up. Uh, and again, I, I think they've used their testing very strategically uh, to move along in the trajectory that they had designed. Uh, a lot of people would go in and say, well, that test was a provocation. They did this because of such and such a holiday or whatever. Uh, I think that's nonsense. The test came at a time where they wanted to make, take the next step. They do have to worry about how they put that test uh, and the criticism they're going to get, you know, politically, sort of in the overall politics landscape, you know, like how upset are the Chinese going to be? And by the way, the Chinese were really upset with the last test. Really, I worked very closely with the Chinese, uh, and they were very upset that they actually tested something which appears to be in the neighborhood of 200 to 250 kilotons, so 10 times the explosive power. Uh, that's that's a, that's a big bomb. And so that's a big bomb. And, and quite frankly, even though people will say, well, hydrogen bombs, you know, they have unlimited uh, yield capacity. And it's true, you can make them as big.
but, but you don't need more than 200, 250 kilotons. So the other thing that uh, people talk about a lot is, well, they can make a bomb, but they can't miniaturize it enough to make it uh, possible to deliver it in a meaningful way. What do we know about that? Yeah, so uh, again, in, in terms of um, how do they design the bombs, you know, what do they do? We don't know anything. Uh, and you didn't see that. No, so I didn't see it. They did not <laughs> yeah. show me. So the important part then on weaponization is that you actually want to be able uh, to make the bomb uh, not only a good size yield, but make it small enough, light enough, and robust enough. And by robust, particularly if you could have put it on a missile. And it looked like all of the focus, looks to me, uh, North Korea has, on delivery has been put on missiles. So they must have decided very early on that if they're going to build a bomb, they're going to deliver it by missiles. So that's the challenge you have, make it light enough, make it small enough, make it robust enough that it can actually withstand the trajectory from being launched to, you know, lots of vibration stresses, and then going through flight and very cold temperatures, and then re-entering through this fiery re-entry into the atmosphere. So that's what it has to do. So that's the trick to get a bomb to the point where you can actually uh, deliver it. And that, we have very little knowledge, and so, we look, I look at that test history of those six tests you know, over uh, 10 years time frame, and that's where they must have learned a lot. Uh, and, and also what they have shown us then, and of course that's the interesting aspect of what they decide to show us. So they've actually shown us you know, what are presumed to be photographs of their nuclear devices. Uh, and they've shown that over the last few years' time frame. So, um, is it your assumption that they have sort of baked in miniaturization all along? In other words, they didn't, they didn't bother making big bombs that were test articles. They decided to, let's make something that ultimately is a practical weapon that can be delivered. Is that the thinking? Yeah, I, I think all, all along. I mean, the first bomb was mostly, I think they had to prove to themselves essentially a proof of principle that they can actually make, you know, a fission bomb. And from that point on, they were determined towards making that bomb deliverable. Uh, and so that progress has been made over this 10-year time frame. And the way, sort of the, the best way that I assess that now, and again, it's, it's we're quite uncertain about that, uh, but in most likelihood, they've done enough tests, and then they've done enough of, of the rocket or missile tests that they most likely can make a fission bomb, an atomic bomb, small enough to mount on the short and medium range rockets, the so-called SCUDs and NODONGs, to deliver a, a nuclear warhead of a Nagasaki a type of explosive power anywhere in South Korea and Japan. When they were able to do that, and I assume just a few years ago, until a few years ago, I still said, I don't think they can do that yet. They don't have enough nuclear tests. You know, by 2009, they only did their second test. 2013 then was their third. So when I was asked 2011 and 12, I said, you just, you can't miniaturize, you know, with two tests. Then they went into 13, did two in 16, and then one in 17. So now you have to conclude they probably know enough and they have the missile technology to put them into those shorter and, and medium range rockets. Now to take them and to put them into the intermediate ranges, we call them, sort of ones that could reach Guam, uh, or the, in the, uh, the ICB, or, or to put them into the ICBM, intercontinental ballistic missiles that could reach the United States, that just is that much more difficult. They have to be smaller, yet they have to be lighter, they have to be even more robust. And so you combine that, and so my view today, you know, as, as we are here in 2018, uh, is they haven't demonstrated th that they can do that. So um, what, what have they demonstrated on their capability, their missile capability, in your view? Right. So from a standpoint of the missiles themselves, uh, actually, there they have uh, made Im impressive progress uh, in the past uh, two to three years time frame. Uh, so they, they went from 
the Scuds and the Nodongs to the intermediate range uh, uh, ballistic missiles, what they call the Wasong-12, uh, that have the capabilities of 3,500 kilometers or so, uh, you know, in the neighborhood of, uh, of, of Guam. I think they've demonstrated that they can actually um, uh, have that sort of reach and capability. Uh, for the ICBM range, uh, they've had these tests called the Hwasong-14, and then the really big one uh, that they did uh, November 29th of 2017. What they demonstrated uh, is that they have the rocket technology that's powerful enough to be able to reach that distance. However, for a whole number of reasons, uh, they shot them in these lofted trajectories. Uh, and so that uh, test would demonstrate that they most likely could reach uh, the United States, but they haven't done that yet. And so from my standpoint, you know, until you test some number of missiles at the standard trajectory of the actual distances, you don't have an operational missile force. So, but I'm also convinced they'll get there. You know, it's just a matter of doing a number of tests to get there. And particularly, those tests are very important that you have to do lots of measurements as to what actually goes on inside that nose cone, inside the reentry vehicle uh, where that nuclear warhead sits. Those materials in the nuclear warhead, they're the most complicated materials in the whole wild, in the whole wide world. You know, plutonium or uranium or these v various uh, other materials, to put it all together, very complicated. How do you make sure that it actually stays together through that uh, uh, complicated reentry process? Uh, so they have to measure. They have to measure, and once they measure, then they have to go back and say, okay, what do we have to do to make sure uh, that we actually have a survivable warhead? And they're not there yet either. Again, they will get there. But quite frankly, to me, this whole focus on ICBMs is the wrong focus. It's the wrong focus. We're much too concerned about whether they can reach the United States or not. What we should be concerned about is, will these guys explode a nuclear weapon? You know, will, by some miscalculation, misjudgment, or whatever, they actually wind up using it on the Korean Peninsula or in Japan? That's the disaster. That's the disaster we have to avoid. That's what we should be focusing on. However, the, the way the U.S. has responded has seemed to indicate, well, you know, we're really not threatened until you can reach us. And, and so it's almost as if we are sort of daring them on to take that next step. Uh, you know, Kim Jong-un had just declared, you know, they had reached the final stage of, of their uh, missile and nuclear development. I would say, let them declare victory. You know, why do we need to go any farther? They already deter the United States from coming in because they can reach all of South Korea. There's some 200,000 U.S. citizens living in South Korea. It would be completely unacceptable to have a nuclear explosion in South Korea. And there's, there's no doubt that they have that capability at that range, correct? Uh, I would say th there's nothing that we have no doubt about. Well, that's true. <laughs> so I have high this is science. <laughs> <laughs> so I have high confidence yeah. that they could actually do so. Uh, and then, of course, you know, initially wh when they built the primitive bombs, you know, 2004, five, six, what I was mostly worried about is, is would they use them like a terrorist bomb? You know, actually load them on a ship and drive them into Incheon Harbor and blow up in a part of South Korea, uh, would they be able to somehow deliver a nuclear weapon where they do unacceptable damage to U.S., our allies, our assets? Yeah, I think they have that. So um, when you look at uh, all of the, the shreds of evidence that we get, externally, whether it's Kim Jong-un with the spherical device that appears to be a bomb or beside the what appear to be portions or pieces of the centrifuges. Wh how are we to take that? Is that propaganda? Or do you suspect, based on your trips and your experience there, that what we're seeing are, are very real? I mean, they could, they could be just wooden props, right? But would you say not? Mm -hmm. 
I think most of, of um, what I've seen uh, and uh, in my discussions and going back to my visits uh, is that almost everything that they show has some element of truth to it, almost everything. Uh, and, and most of it is actually uh, truthful. So when uh, they showed me these things early on when I came back, you know, both in terms of the plutonium-related visits to the complex and then the enriched uranium, uh, people here were very skeptical. They said, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, they just pulled this stuff over, over your eyes. They really aren't capable of doing that, and they were capable of doing that. So, so yeah, I think they show us a lot. But, you know, a really important question to ask is, uh, a really important question to ask is, why do they show us that? Okay, so what's so important, and, and that's what I try to understand. So again, I'm, I'm not just a detective, I'm a guy trying to figure out, uh, understand North Korea. So to understand, you have to understand, what do they have? And then, what's their motivation? So it's capability and motivation. And motivation you can hardly ever get by sitting here in the United States. You, you got to go there. You got to talk to people who've gone there. You got to understand much more. You then have to try and understand why are they showing this to us? What's their motivation? Now, if their motivation was to launch a Pearl Harbor type of sneak attack on the United States, why in the world would they show us these facilities? Why would they have a blue roof on their centrifuge facility? You know, why would they allow somebody like me and, and show me all these different things? You know, to me, that really says they want us to really believe that they have the capability and they want to deter us. It's not that they want a surprise attack, they want to deter us. And so if they want to deter us, then we have to understand that and you have to build that into uh, whatever your, your policy strategy, your, your diplomatic strategy is. Do you have the sense that uh, for, for quite a long time now we have been misreading this whole thing and, and not responding in a, in a way that improves the situation? Yeah, I, I, I've been very disappointed uh, uh, with the way uh, the U.S. government has actually uh, interfaced uh, with the North Koreans. Uh, and, uh, and this is... Um, What's really important, it's not politics. You know, it really doesn't matter whether it's Democrat or Republican. But if you've looked back uh, over a number of presidents, we've just not done well. So the last time uh, we actually got them to arrest their program from what their intention was and actually step back uh, was during the Clinton years uh, of this thing called the Agreed Framework. Uh, which lots of people, very, very skeptical at the beginning and still skeptical, but, but they're not giving credit for the fact that the North Koreans actually let two big reactors die and they wound up with a plutonium production capacity that's at most six kilograms per year, sort of one bomb's worth per year at best. They gave up the two bigger reactors that would have given them a production capacity annually of 300 kilograms. It's gone. Those reactors died during eight years of just sitting there, being frozen. So, uh, but from that point on, we took steps. Uh, one of the most important missteps taken uh, was when the Bush administration stepped away from the agreed framework. Uh, they thought they did so for a very good reason, but they weren't prepared for the consequences. Uh, and then during the Obama administration, where it looked like one might have, you know, some sense uh, of diplomatically engaging them, uh, it also didn't work. And in my opinion, the real serious effort was really never made. Uh, so when people today say that, hey, time for talking is over, if you really look back, you know, over the last uh, eight, nine years now, we haven't talked. There hasn't been much engagement. And in the meantime, they've gone ahead and they developed a nuclear arsenal that threatens us, that can inflict unacceptable damage. And we know nothing about them. We know nothing about the guy with the button, as it was said. We know nothing about the military uh, that counsels him. There is no other set of nuclear powers in the world that don't talk to each other where the military doesn't talk to each other, where they have some knowledge of each other. 
because you have to know how is the other side going to respond. You know, if some sort of miscalculation comes up, a misjudgment, we don't know that. We haven't done that. So it's so important to go in and talk, talk to avoid a nuclear catastrophe and negotiate later. Engagement works. We have proof of that. So in my opinion, as I've gone back, and I've tried to develop sort of a comprehensive history of North Korea nuclear program, uh, that's indeed what it shows. If you take a nonpartisan look, uh, look at that whole 25 years, uh, is at the time where we had engagement. And what's particularly interesting, if we had engagement to the level where we had Americans on the ground in North Korea, and especially in Yongbyon, we had Americans on the ground, when that happened, engagement worked. They either went backwards or at least didn't go ahead and greatly go forwards. They still did things clandestinely. You know, they never went to the, to the place where they totally gave up everything in nuclear because they felt their survival depended on it. But as soon as we disengaged, as soon as we got our people out of Yongbyon, then they could go full force, and they did. And that's why you've seen so much progress you know, in these last, particularly four or five years, but even altogether in the last nine years made progress because no one's been there on the ground since 2009. So pounding our fist on the table and insisting North Korea denuclearize, that's not a realistic approach, is it? So in my opinion, if you study very carefully, so in this comprehensive way of how did they nuclearize and what did they actually have? And so you have to, again, look very carefully. Three things, uh, nuclear bomb fuel, plutonium, highly enriched uranium, and the tritium, you know, hydrogen isotopes. Each one of those requires significant number of facilities, huge number of people. They have huge, huge things invested to get there. Weaponization, it takes everything from computer codes to, uh, to machinists, to explosive specialists, to people who run the test site, a huge enterprise. Delivery system, the missiles, you know, all those missiles, all of the testing, that's nuclear. To think that you can turn that off overnight when it took 25 years to get there is completely unrealistic and also unhelpful. Uh, I think the best that you can do now is if you look at all those things sort of having gone into the red, you know, danger zone, you just now have to, first of all, make sure nuclear weapons are not used and then dial it back, step at a time, but it's going to take many years so, in your view, would it be foolish at this juncture, perhaps extremely dangerous, not to re-engage with the North Koreans on some meaningful level? Right. So we have not re-engaged with the North Koreans now for some time, and it's very dangerous to continue that course of action. Cold War days, we used to report on Russia based on what lights were lit up in the Kremlin at night. You know, this is, this is one of those tea leaves kind of things. Do you, do you feel like we, with all these disparate little pieces of information, including visits like you had, and the, the, the photos we see, the, the launches, the, the sensors, all the capability we have, do we have a reasonably full picture or not? No, I, I think we really don't understand North Korea well. And actually, part of that reason you know, we've actually been too focused on the nuclear piece. You know, one of my colleagues likes to say that back in the early 90s already, sort of the arms control and the nuclear mafia hijacked the negotiations. The negotiations should have been much broader. Our attempt to understand North Korea should have been much broader uh, because you're not going to solve the North Korea puzzle, so to speak, by just the nuclear piece alone. And so, yeah, we need to go more broadly. You know, and then if you look at what happened with the Soviet Union, there were people in the United States who really promoted engagement you know, with the Soviet people at the educational level, at the people level. All of those things were absolutely crucial you know, in eventually sort of turning around things over there. We're not doing that now with North Korea, and so, uh, this denuclearization, indeed, that focus is far too narrow. And so engaging on a broader perspective 
is important. And of course, what we have to look at it from our standpoint. So what's the risk? So North Korea takes a, risks, uh, a risk when they engage with us. We take a risk. Their risk is existential. If they make a mistake, the regime's gone, you know, the country's gone. In our case, certainly unacceptable damage, but there's no way North Korea poses an existential risk to the United States of America. You know, and we don't need nuclear weapons for North Korea. Uh, so having that understanding, if somebody's going to have to take a risk to really get to solve this problem, it's going to have to be us. You know, I hope we can overcome the domestic politics to take the risk, but, but keep our you know, head screwed on correctly and watch the nuclear game. Decide what's a big risk, what's a little risk. You know, what can we take, what shouldn't we take? We've not done that. You know, for example, the Kill the Agreed Framework, that was killed because Bush administration believed the North Koreans were cheating, so to speak, by clandestinely developing the second path to the bomb uranium enrichment. It turns out they were. We weren't sure, but they were. And particularly once they showed me the facility, that was existence proof that they, yes, they were cheating already or they were developing that in 2000. Was that important enough to kill the agreed framework, to let them restart the reactor, reprocess the plutonium, build the bomb? It wasn't important enough. We should have had a different algorithm as to say, how do we deal with the fact we don't like you guys developing uranium enrichment, but we're not going to walk out and, and let you continue uh, and, again, restart the reactor. So that, that sort of, sort of risk-based thinking just hasn't, hasn't been done. It's you know, a problem for the United States and for the rest of the world. Sig Hecker, thank you for your time and your insights. In this politically polarized, post-fact, anti-science era, I think it's really important we set the nonsense talk aside and listen to people like Sid. The stakes really couldn't be higher. I'm Miles O'Brien. That's Miles to go. I promise I'll be back sooner rather than later.